Hi there, welcome back to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. Um, I'm going to do another interpretation of one of Donna's dreams. I've been waiting on Father for a confirmation um, that he actually wanted me to, um, to share this interpretation of a dream that she had. And he has given it to me. Um, this will also be the last interpretation that I do for Donna, unless Father leads otherwise. Um, and yeah, I think the, the importance of this uh, vision, the vision that she had, is and the reason behind it is to let us know just how close the tribulation is um, to break out. Um, also to uh, this vision and a lot of uh, symbolism in it that needed some explaining. So I had to put some scripture together in order to explain it. And um, also just to let us know that he will soon be sending out his workers to bring in that great harvest. So I pray that this um, uh, interpretation with a bit of teaching with it will um, just encourage you, give you greater understanding and uh, cause you to uh, uh, um, just be very serious at the moment with what Father is about in your heart personally. Because whatever is in our heart, whatever we have not dealt with, will be an issue in the time to come with. Um, we will still have to deal with our heart. Our heart is not going to be cut out and left somewhere. We're not going to be robots. We still are going to live from out of the heart, out of which all things in life flows. It's out of the heart. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to read her vision that she had. And um, then we'll take it from there. Okay. So it's called God's Appointed Clock Vision. I'm just going to read it as she um, told it on her channel. In this vision, I'm standing at a door and the line is long. And I'm at the end of the line and I'm wondering, why am I at the end of the line? I'm wondering why I am last and not first. And I see the clock on the door and it is one second to midnight. But it appears to me that the clock is not moving. I'm crying out for the timekeeper to check the time on the door. And there in the vision appears to be an angel in white. And I can see the white wings and I can see him clothed in pure white. And I say, sir, something is wrong with your clock. He turns and I see his face and I say, my Lord, I'm sorry, my Lord. I did not mean to speak to you so harshly. I thought you were a timekeeper. I only wanted to know why the clock was not moving. And my Lord speaks to me in the vision and he says, The appointed time of my father is here and nothing can move the clock forward or backwards. For it is the appointed time of my father. And I said, yes, my Lord, yes, my Lord, I know about the appointed time of the Father. And as I get closer to the door, there is a woman standing at the door. And I know the woman and she hands me a veil and I say to the woman in the vision, I don't need a veil. I was born with a veil. I do not need any of your veils. She takes off a veil that is scarlet. She takes off a veil that is purple. She takes off a veil that is made of gold. And then lastly, she takes off a veil that is white. And she is trying to give me a veil. She hands me a pearl. And the pearl is huge. It is a big pearl. And I say to the woman, you did not take the pearl off the gate of heaven, did you? And she says, no, I did not, but the pearl is yours. And I look down and in my left hand, I have a wooden basket. And I say, you can put the pearl in my wooden basket. And so she lays the pearl inside the basket I have in my left hand. But in my right hand, I have a lamp. And it is a lamp full of oil and it is light full of light and it is a bright light the light in my right hand is bright and i say are you going through the door or the gate she says 
I'm waiting at both. I will not enter into either one until the last bride has come through the door and the gate. And I say, well, then you're going with me because it appears that I am the last bride. I'm standing at the end of the line and I am the last. And I see another man standing there that appears to be the angel of the Lord. I can see his wings and they are stretched out and they are beautiful wings. He is beautiful in the vision. And I say to the man, why am I last? Why am I not the first? Why am I last? And he says, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And I said, then I will keep my place in the line. I do not want to move forward. I will remain where I am in this line. And he turns. And the woman at the gate, at the door, is giving out pearls to everyone in the line who is waiting. She is giving out pearls. And I am wondering, where did she get these pearls? Did she take them from the gates of heaven? Because she has pearls. And I look down in my basket, and my basket is made of wood. And I see my pearl as I am getting closer. My pearl is getting bigger. I'm looking at my pearl and I'm thinking, why are you growing as we get closer to the door and the line moving? But I did not see the door opening. I did not see the gate open, but yet the line is getting shorter and I'm getting closer to the door. And then when I'm at the door and at the gate, by the time I'm at the door and the gate in the vision, my pearl is bigger than my basket. Bigger than the basket when I placed it in. And then the vision is over and I think, no, don't let the vision be over. I'm about to enter into the door and the gates. Don't let the vision end. I'm ready to take my step into the kingdom of heaven. And the vision is over. And I'm thinking, why am I having so many visions and so many dreams? Okay, so here's the interpretation and some teaching within the interpretation. A summary first. This dream is about the harvest workers during the tribulation and how close we are to the actual beginning of the tribulation. Donna is at the end of the line. And when somebody is at the end of the line, it speaks of the fact that they've reached the point of no return. Saying, I'm at the end of my line or at the end of the road. The dictionary describes this as such. The point at which it is no longer possible to continue with productivity or activity. So she's waiting in a line, right? She's done what she needed to do. This means what needed to be done at this point has been done. Now something new or different has to begin. Standing at the end of the line does not only speak of a literal place, but also a place in time, God's appointed time, which is the purpose of this vision given. Many receive visions and dreams, but fail to ask what is the purpose in, for God giving it. It is one second to midnight, which further confirms just how close we are on God's clock, that nobody, nobody can move forward or backwards. The Father has set this appointed time and it is not going to change. The reason why it appears that the clock is not moving is because in our waiting, time seems to stand still. The line she is standing in is a line for the worker brides, pointing to the friends of the bridegroom, part of the bridal company that are the priests of God. It's important that you know that those standing in the line are priests unto him. So it's not the general bride, it's the worker bride. This is also why Donna has a lamp full of oil that is very bright and a reference to being as John the Baptist, who was a priest known as the friend of the bridegroom, who came as a light pointing to the light. He was not the light, but pointed to the light, but pointed as a light to the light. Donna told me that I am this woman that she saw in this dream, confirming the witness in my spirit before she told me. 
because as I listened to the vision, I knew she, it was me that she was talking about. So afterwards she came to me and she said to me that it was me that she saw. Um, and you will see why I say this once I give my testimony, a bit of a testimony of what Father has shown me. I would also just like to mention that Donna knows absolutely nothing about what Father has personally revealed to me, all the things that he speaks to me in dreams about. The calling upon my life is to prepare the work of bride for the tribulation. There will be different workers for different time periods of the tribulation. And although the Lord uses me with dreams and visions, the main focus of my call is to repair the work of bride to have the character to endure what is to come based on scripture and understanding of how their present trials are preparing them even now. So not all will be workers. Those who are standing in this line are the worker brides, the priests. It is the appointed time of that which the Father has prepared them for to start. They are all part of the bride. This is why they receive a veil. So from the beginning of the line where Donna is standing, where she's saying she's lost, right? Right up to the door is a time period. Okay. Those who are standing in the line are the work of Bryce the priest. It's an appointed time of what which the Father has prepared them for to start. They are all part of the bride. This is why they receive a veil. So veils goes to brides, right? We are to read the word, not just as that which was in the past, the was. We also need to read it now and how it applies, applies to us now, the ease. Okay, what, are, what am I learning now out of my out of what Father is showing me in Psalms or Proverbs or Ephesians. What is he showing to me now in my personal life? Okay, but reading it in the was, was what am I learning out of the storyline? What happened here? What is the overall wisdom that he's teaching me? But then he wants us also to read the scripture eschatologically. That means all scripture, not just Matthew 24 that people mostly go to, but the discourses in Luke and Mark as well. The discourses in, in the book of John. He wants us to read the whole of the New Testament also as in the was to, in that which is to come, is the, eschatologically. So he is the word who was, who is, and is to come. That's why the word needs to be read in the was, the is, and the is to come. Okay, so when I give this interpretation, it is with the context of what is to come, the future. To understand the context of the law shall be first and the first shall be last, we have to take the different colors of the veils into consideration as well. These veils point to the different colors of the robe of Christ during the crucifixion written about in the three synoptic gospels and the book of John as well. Many believe that the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, are merely different viewpoints of three different men, hence the seemingly discrepancies that some wish to point out to discredit the infallible word of God. And this is not true. God does not make mistakes. So we had a very good reason to ensure by the Spirit that all three accounts of the gospel are included within the Bible with their differences. Let's read what the different synoptic gospels say about his robe during the crucifixion, taking into consideration that these different colors point to the different time periods within the Great Tribulation. So each color points to a different time period. So this is all about the crucifixion. In Matthew 27, verse 28, we read, And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Then the same account in Mark 15, verse 17, we read, And they clothed him with purple and planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. So in Mark, it is purple. In Luke 23, verse 11, we read, And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe. So you've got a scarlet robe in Matthew, you've got a purple robe in Mark, 
and you have a gorgeous rogue in Luke, all the same account. The word gorgeous is G2986 and it means radiant, clear, gay, goodly, gorgeous and white. Sounds like a bride to me. And you will remember, lastly, I took out a white veil as well. So as you can see, there is a clear difference in the colors in the same account spoken in all three the Gospels. And surely this asks of us to pay attention to this. So we are told in John 19 the following. So we're now going to John's uh, account of the crucifixion. Verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. So there was no seam on the coat, but he had other garments that were divided into four. His coat could not be torn because it speaks of his priesthood, which is eternal after the order of Melchizedek. However, his coat also points to the veil within the temple that had no seam that was torn at that time of the crucifixion, pointing to us that are able to enter within the veil. Okay, so that's the coat that could not be torn. His garment, however, that was divided in four parts. This speaks of the book of John added to the three synoptic gospels. So everybody knows that Mark, Matthew, Matthew, Mark and Luke and John all have the same stories within them, the same testimonies, but now we are talking about the differences within them. Okay. Um, the book of John has a very specific focus on priesthood. So every time you hear of a John in scripture, you can know that it points to the priesthood. And the book of John is very much um, uh, 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 overall, being 21 chapters um, of, the, uh, 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 um, of the three Gospels within them, but with a focus on the priesthood. Every time you hear a John, you should think of the priesthood. This is one of the overall purpose of the book of John, which is to summarize the three synoptic gospels with an emphasis on the work of right and holiness as priests unto him. Holiness speaks of purity and being washed in the blood and holiness points to the priests. So remember, I said the workers are the priests. John 19 verse 2 talks about this robe now. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. So we have in Mark a purple robe and in John a purple robe. This color purple is not the same color purple mentioned in Mark 15 verse 17. This purple in John is bluish red when you go into the Strong's Concordance, but points to the effort of that the priests wore. This effort was made with red and blue, also the colors of the pomegranates at the seam made of red and blue thread. So when you mix blue and red, you get purple. The purple in Mark means purple fish, which also speaks of the time of a great harvest or catch during the tribulation of the seals. To summarize quickly, Matthew has a scarlet robe. Mark has a purple robe. Luke has a gorgeous white robe. And with John, we have a bluish red that makes up a purple robe. Now these were the veil colors I was handing out to the different workers during the tribulation as they were standing on the line to go up to the door or the gates. The different colors point to a certain time period. However, there was also a gold veil. Gold has two meanings. It speaks of, it speaks of kingly authority and it speaks of faith tried within a furnace where our faith comes out as pure gold. The gold veil speaks of the millennial reign where his kings and priests at the end of the tribulation will receive cities to reign over, written in Luke 22, and will have the responsibility as worker brides still to teach. In the 28th chapter of Matthew, we read that they teach 
they no longer preach, speaking of the end of the world, pointing to the millennial reign. And let's read it with the eyes of that which is to come. Okay, so we're going to read about that in Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Here's the part that we need to see and take note of. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So the context of Matthew 28 here is the end of the world, the millennial reign, where, the, where it is a kingdom of kings and priests that will teach the nations. No longer preach, but teach. He's already here. Everybody knows who he is. Okay. We know that Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Here you can see how the first book points to the last or the end of the world. A further reason to see why the Matthew account points to the end is because Yeshua's robe is scarlet in the book of Matthew, right? We find a reference to this in Revelation 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So you do not get the word scarlet in Mark and Luke. You only get it in Matthew. And you have just shown that the book of Matthew points to the end of trumpets, or during the trumpet period. Indeed, many know that the book of Matthew was written to the Jews, pointing eschatologically to Jacob's trouble or the trumpet period of the tribulation. Therefore, Matthew, who is the first, is actually the last. So the tribulation will happen Luke first, then Mark, and then Matthew. First the bride, then the fullness of the Gentiles to come, and then lastly the Jews. This would make Luke, with the gorgeous white robe, pointing to the bride of Christ, to be the first. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. This is why the angel told Donna that the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Please understand that these colors represent not just the time period that the workers will be part of, but the workers are part of the bride. Some will have already been raptured to safety, whilst the workers are here to bring in the harvest. The colors mentioned are white, purple, scarlet, gold, and to top it off, I gave out pearls. True to the enemy's nature, nothing he does has an original thought, so he copies the worker bride's colors onto his bride, Jezebel. That's written in Revelation 17 verse 4. It's um, listen to the colors. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. There's no white mentioned because she stands in contrast to the purity of the bride, being full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now you understand why I was giving out different color veils. Veils are only meant for a bride. And these people represent the worker bride with their different color veils. The first bride wears the gorgeous white veil, represented by Luke, who is the last but will also be the first. The seals period of the tribulation represents the time of the Gentiles, the purple veil, which is the Mark group. This is what Donna's vision is about. They represent the apostles and the Smyrna group, or church, right? And then we have the scarlet veil pointing to Jacob's trouble, the trumpets period, which is the Matthew group. This Matthew group is represented by the 144,000, which is the Philadelphia church in Revelation 3, that will follow the Lamb wheresoever he will go. 
written about also in Revelation 14. Okay. Donna did not want a veil and said that she was born with a veil and did not need my veil. This points to one of her dreams that she had that was called Red Dust. You will find that on my um, uh, YouTube channel as well. Where the interpretation speak of Yeshua who came to two men on the road of Emmaus and he opened up to them their understanding of the scriptures. They were unveiled and had perfect understanding. Their hearts were burning, it says. This points to a verse only mentioned, only mentioned in the book of Luke. In Luke 1 verse 3. And it seems, uh, uh, this is what Luke says. It seems good to him also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. Think of how bold that statement is to say that he has perfect understanding of the order of how things should be. So he was the first Luke. Okay. The Luke worker bride points to two groups, the apostles and the disciples. The two on Emmaus being a type and shadow of the apostles and the Smyrna church or the Smyrna group. They will have perfect understanding of scripture and will receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of which we read in Acts 2, which is a type and shadow. They are not veiled, but have full understanding. Donna did not want the veil. The apostles will demonstrate great power and signs and the disciples, the Smyrna group, worker group, will lay their necks on the line, you read in Revelation 3, literally being his witnesses just like John the Baptist. Um, I think in Romans 16 it talks about Priscilla and Aquila, they are a type and shadow of the Smyrna group that lay their necks on the line. Um, because they are the first, remember I say John the Baptist, um, Donna had a light in her hand and John the Baptist came as a light to point to the light. Because they are the first, the Luke group, they are also those who form part of the kings and priests that will rule during the millennial reign at the last. Donna in this vision forms part of this group having understanding of the word, the light unto their path and unto the world pointing to the light. As I mentioned before, Donna does not know any intimate details of what Father has shared with me through all these years. About four years ago, I went on a 40-day fast, during which he gave me pearls of wisdom. They consist of short statements of I am's and you are's, um, and also to wisdom that is given me at that packs a punch. Then about two years after that, I had a vision. And in this vision, I'm standing at a river with Yeshua. I told him that it's very difficult for me to, um, to do the things that he asks of me, to give his messages, and then for people to just ignore it, and that it breaks my heart. And the next moment, he gave me an apple, a beautiful red apple, and he said to me, taste and see. And I bit into the apple, and it was indeed sweet. And the next moment, the apple became rotten in my mouth. Very disgusting. And it reminded me of the manna that went bad um, the next day in the wilderness. And then he said to me, such is my word, bitter and sweet, both for the hearers and those who speak, like precious pearls trampled underfoot by swine. And this made me very sad when he told me this, because what he reveals to me for me is of great value. It's very precious to me. Yeshua then asked me, do you remember the pearls I gave you? And I said, yes, Lord. He's talking about the 40-day fast pearls that he gave me. And then he said to me, have you done what I told you? And to my shame, I answered, no, Lord. I love those pearls, but I've not kept them all. The next moment, I saw the string of beautiful pearls around my neck, and I knew it was the pearls that he gave me during the 40-day fast. And suddenly, they were all different colors. And when I looked down, I saw that I was dressed in a white wedding gown and the pearls were embroidered into the dress with gold and white pearls. And it was very beautiful. Psalm 45 paints a similar picture to this from verse 13. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. 
She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins and companions that follow her shall be brought unto thee. And then he said to me, I beautify my bride with pearls of wisdom. And then he said, don't lose my pearls. So the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a pearl of great price. That's one of the parables that Yeshua spoke about. Let's read about that in Matthew 13, verse 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Pearls of quality, right? Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Not only do we see the type and shadow of Christ, the merchant, who has left all he had and paid with his very life and blood for his goodly pearls, but we also have to leave all behind to be counted worthy to be his disciples. One pearl is priceless to him, and so to those disciples who have forsaken all to follow him will count every pearl priceless. Every soul saved will bring great rejoicing. This is also something that he laid upon my heart recently. Um, I call it the miracle of one, where he has emphasized more and more to me how great value he places on one soul. That he will leave everything behind for that one soul. I gave Donna a pearl in her wooden basket. The wood speaks of the cross pointing to the gospel and she is collecting more pearls so to speak. The pearl she received is as a seed that grows. So one seed or pearl can produce many. This is why it is a basket in a hand because it speaks of a harvest. The pearl outgrows the basket and this is because the promise is that of more than what she can ever contain. The harvest she will bring in will be great. Also, Yeshua said that the kingdom of God is also as leaven. Leaven rises and increases in size, just like this pearl. It speaks of a great harvest basket being brought in. And as everyone who has received their veil and pearls move up in the line and through the door, it speaks of everyone bringing in their harvest at their appointed time. On this line that they are standing. The pearls I'm giving out also represent the pearls of wisdom he has taught me and will teach me during the tribulation to help his work abroad, of which I myself am one. Donna, Donna asks me whether I am going through the gate or the door. Both a gate and a door are mentioned. I tell her, no, I am waiting at both and that I will not enter into either one until the last bride has come through the door and the gate. I am standing in front of the door and the gate as a porter. The reason I am not entering in is because Father has revealed to me through various means that I will be here right through to the end of the tribulation. So the bride I'm referring to here is the worker bride, remember? They are responsible to bring in the harvest and the harvest is the servants sent out during the tribulation to gather the guests to the wedding written about in Matthew 22. So go to the scriptures that I mention in this. The book of Mark and its discourse points to the fullness of the Gentiles the great harvest or the guests of the wedding feast to be gathered. So just some information about the porters. The Levitical priesthood, and specifically from the sons of Korah, was responsible for the temple service, which included being porters, looking after the vessels within the inner court and worship service. So the sons of Korah were porters, they were looking after the vessels in the inner court and then they were also worship, uh, worshippers. Porters would stand at the different gates to ensure that no unwanted elements would enter, specifically Gentiles. They are watchmen, not on the wall, but at the gate. They were assigned to the four directions, the east, west, north and south. They served normally during the pilgrim feasts of God during a time that the streets of Jerusalem were overflowing with crowds. 
So a perfect example of this is the triumphant entry of Yeshua on the donkey where a multitude awaited him with, a, with palm branches, right? This pointing to the rapture of the great multitude that is mentioned in Revelation 7 where they stand clothed in white waving palm branches before the Lord, before the Lamb. The donkey he rides on is a reference to the worker wars or priests. Issachar, who was a priest, was a Levitical priest and the blessing over him was that he would be as a donkey. These porters also lived inside the chambers of the tabernacle and the temple. They were responsible for open, opening the tabernacle or the temple for morning sacrifices and at closing for the evening sacrifices. The porter's duties reached beyond the duties that one would normally expect. They were also entrusted to be in charge of protecting and monitoring the treasures of the house of God. And the treasures made me think of the poles. They were also responsible for enforcing the death penalty on those who entered the temple illegally. They would be stoned if they tried to enter. So the porters were judges. Donna, after I told her I'm going in last, tells me that I'm going with her because it appears that she is the last bride. This is true that I am part of the company, part of the Luke bride, so to speak. But I've been given an assignment to stay to the very last. These that were last will be honoured by him by receiving crowns and cities to rule over. They are the guileless ones who follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. The, there are two type and shadows of guileless ones in scripture. Nathaniel in John 1 and the 144,000 in Revelation 14. So there are two groups of 144,000. One for the seals harvest and one for the trumpets harvest. They represent the 10% of that particular harvest. They will lay their crowns at his feet. So the seals harvest is a grain harvest or a wheat harvest. The trumpets harvest is a, uh, a grape and an olive harvest. Okay. This also explains why Father has been speaking so much to me about guile and giving me messages in my different devotionals about um, guilelessness and there will be another one coming soon as well. He is getting very serious with preparing us for this great harvest so that we, with baskets full and overflowing with goodly pulls, may bring to the great merchant who has brought them, bought them with his blood, may bring it to him. Now, reading Psalm 24 gives us a scriptural reference for Donna's dream, a scripture where both a gate and a door are mentioned as per her dream. The porters are called on to open the everlasting doors or gates and doors for the King of Glory to enter. It talks about those who may come up to the hill of the Lord and into His presence, making it clear that not all may enter. Psalm 24, let's read it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and all they that dwell therein. For we have founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands, a pure heart, guileless, who hath not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing of the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, o, you, o ye gates, and be ye lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up, O ye heads, O ye gates, and even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of Glory, Selah. So you can see just how Father is affirming his word through all of this, the dream that he gave to Donna. So I want to read uh, a word that Father gave me uh, the 5th of July last year. It's called An Appointed Time. 
and it, I, I believe uh, it accompanies this, uh, this dream and the interpretation well. And I pray that you will hear the earnestness um, within the word that Father is giving and that he means business. The appointed time. Surely that which I have preordained is about to come to pass. Even that of your own life, the words I've spoken over you. For every word has its appointed time. As time passes and will be no more, know that I have an appointed time for all I have said to be, manifesting my purposes to this world through my appointed ones. For it is an appointed time that the clock of this world is ticking. However, though the enemy think it is his time, it is in fact my time. Have I not said that there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven? A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time of mourning and a time to dance, a time of war and a time of peace. I make all things beautiful in its time. My eternal clock is not outside of me, but is in me, and you are in me, in eternity, even now. I will use my instruments of war, my horses sent out to fulfill my purposes at its appointed time. Both my horses of destruction, of which you have read in the book of Revelator, as well as my valiant horses, prepared for such a time as this. They will conquer not in their own strength, for they have none, but will be strengthened by my spirit to run the race set before them. Even so, know that there is an appointed time for peace, not the peace of this world, but mine. Therefore, knowing the peace that I will crown you with and fill you with, knowing the joy set before you, set your face as a flint to endure to the end. I will not forsake you. I will never forsake you. No one has greater love than he who lays his life down for his friends. You are my friends. Let us ride, therefore, in the strength of the Spirit, enduring all things for my Father's kingdom. An appointed time for all things. I know the thoughts that I have for you, and have not and will not forsake them. My words written in your book of life shall come to pass in its time. Time to gird up your loins and set your face as a flint to finish the course. Run to obtain the prize. Strengthen the feeble knees and set right that which causes you to falter. If not, you will fall behind and it will become a snare. Not only to fall behind, but if possible, to not finish your race. Have I not said that if possible, even the elect will fall away. Woe to those who think they stand, who teaches others yet compromise with sin. As Joseph ran from temptation, so run from the snares set before you. Great testing and trials will be your portion on this last stretch of this race. Will you endure when you are still ensnared with petty sins? Will you endure when the cares of this world bears down upon you? Cast your care upon me and let us run together and finish the race. I'm thinking of John 15 where it says, How can you endure, how can you run with the horses in the Jordan if you cannot run or endure with the footman? You know, the footman speaks of the seal spirit. Um, the Jordan, crossing the Jordan, speaks of Canaan, that speaks of the trumpet period. It's talk, talking about how can you endure, you have to endure, you have to have that character, that uh, you have to be wax strong in spirit to endure what's coming. And if you can't even endure the things that you are experiencing now, that you are weak, 
How will you endure what I've called you to, what I've written and spoken to you about in your life that I have always intended for you to fulfill? If you are not willing to get rid of those very things that causes your hands to be weak, to, to, to fall down, that causes your feet to move in the wrong direction, if you don't focus on the things that I'm busy with in your heart, how will you endure? So I pray that you will hear the admonition and exhortation from the Lord and just how close we are and, um, and make earnest with what he's busy with in your own personal life. Amen. Bless you.